I asked to do the honors because you don't often get to introduce a, a person like this. He is not only a friend, he's a former neighbor. We both lived in Smyrna for several years together. Didn't even know each other for most of that time. <clears throat> he was walking his dog one Sunday and I was changing a flat tire. And uh, like the former officer he was, he provided some excellent supervision as I finished that <laughs> task. I want you to buy his book because this man has led as full a life as anybody you know. And he has earned so many distinctions that it would take a, a long time to repeat them all. But let me just tell you something about Mel that I think capsulizes him as a person. When you get to know him just a little bit, <clears throat> what you come to understand is that Mel Pender is a person who exemplifies in his daily life the biblical injunction of the prophet Micah to seek justice, love, mercy, and walk humbly with our God. So with that, let me introduce my friend, former neighbor, and our comrade at arms, Mel Pender. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, uh, I was asked to do this at the, at the last minute. Uh, your, your speaker uh, couldn't make it. But I have a book back there, so I'm glad you can buy it. <laughs> you know, uh, the motorcycle gentleman that was up here in VE, VE is it VEO? Yes. Good job. Thank you. We need to help our vets. I, uh, I'm a true American. I love my country. I love the red, white, and blue. But I had, have had a lot of challenges in my life. And a quote by Nathan Hale prior, prior to his execution by the British in 1776, he says, I only regret that I have but one life to lose. And that's the life. And that life is for my country. And that's me. I spent two tours in Vietnam. I was in the 9th Division, Mekong Delta. We were the first American troops down there, 1966, 67, a young second lieutenant. I was a staff sergeant uh, before I went to OCS. After 11 years, I went to OCS and got commissioned and went to Fort Riley, Kansas, and straight to Vietnam with the 9th Division. You know, we live in the greatest country in the world, gentlemen. I ain't been one country like America, and I've been around the world. And with so many quotes by so many different people, like Martin Luther King addressed a, addressed a crowd of 250,000 people at the Lincoln Memorial, Memorial. He said, I have a dream. And he said, one day this nation would rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed, that all men will be created equal. Now, I grew up in the South back in the day uh, when it was not really good for blacks. It was actually terrible. I'm 80 years old. I look good, don't I? Yeah. And that's that cornbread and collard greens. <laughs> you know, I grew up in a community in Linwood Park, it's right, at, right in Brookhaven, a little black community there, on Windsor Parkway. But before I moved to uh, Linwood Park, I lived in Dalton, Georgia. My parents are from Dalton, corporate center of the world. Used to be the, used to be the bedspread center, I mean, used to be the bedspread center of the world. They made chenille spreads. And when I was a kid, on Saturday, the only time you go to the movie was on Saturday, and I saw this movie by Audie Murphy, To Hell and Back. And I want to be just like Artie Murphy. He was short in stature, but didn't look good as I did. <laughs> but I love this guy. I, had, I wanted to be in the military and I would be just like Artie Murphy. So when I turned 17 years old, I joined the military. I was sent to uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, 101st Training Regiment. Then I was sent to Fort Leonard, Missouri to be a, a carpenter. I hated it. I went to be with the 82nd Airborne. But back then, they were still putting blacks in units where they, all, where they were truck drivers or con constructions and, uh, and construction or cooks. But I spent 18 months in England 
rebuilding all the airstrips that was bombed by the Germans. I was in, I was in an organization called Skywarf. That was the Army working engineers working for the Air Force. We worked anywhere from 18 to 20 hours a day building these airstrips. But when my time was up in England, I re-enlisted and I went to the 82nd Airborne Division. And I finally got the unit that I wanted to be in. I was a very proud person to go in the 82nd Airborne Division. Then I was sent to Okinawa to 503rd, my unit. I went to, went to uh, Okinawa. And in Okinawa, I was playing football one day. And the coach said, I want you to run against this Japanese Olympic team. And I knew nothing about track. I was the fastest guy on the football team. I knew nothing about track and field. He said, pick up some shoes from the supply room and some shorts, and I'll pick you up and take you down to Nago, north end of the island. I said, I don't even think about track, coach. He said, don't worry. You're gonna, you, don't worry. You, you're going to beat the guy. You're going to beat all of them. Don't worry about it. But these guys were training for the 1964 Olympics in Tokyo. So I went down to Nago, and I watched these guys come out of the blocks, and they stretched. I, I just watched everything they did, and I did everything they did. There was 10,000 people there. I think everybody on the island was there. And I said, what the hell have I got myself into? So the gun went off. They went off. Then I said, I guess I better go. <laughs> <laughs> and I beat the best sprinter that competed in the to in Tokyo Olympics in 1964. That was 1962. I was 25 years old, and at 25 running 9.5 in the hundreds, not, not heard of. But I had schools like UCLA, Southern Cal, Fresno State, wanted me to get out of the Army and go and to run track uh, with their track team. But I was married, and, and I said, I can't go. So I was going to go to Clark College in Atlanta, and I said, I can't do it. So I re-enlisted and went, went to the 101st Airborne Division for six months, and they sent me to Korea. We Jambu, I Corps. I was there for 13 months. I read about the Army track team in the Army Times newspaper, and they was looking for college runners. And I never had no college. But I wrote a letter to them, and they gave me two hours a day to train back at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, 82nd Airborne Division. And I was treated like hell, because I was an athlete. It wasn't good. But I went to my first track meet in St. Louis, Missouri. I, I didn't even make the finals. It was in 1962, 60, going on 60, yeah, 63. But in 1962, in 1963, I was like number two in the world at 100 meters. I came back at age 26, and age 27, I made my first Olympic team in, in Tokyo. I went back to Tokyo, and just like I said I was going to do. I was 27 years old. No one in the history of track and field has ran as fast as I ran. I was running with the great Bob Hayes, Bullet Bob. I was number two behind Bob. Also, we had a guy named Trenton Jackson. I was the oldest guy on the team, along with Ralph Boston, who went to Tennessee State, was a five-time Olympian. My buddy punched me in the stomach, right? He was passing around, punched me in the stomach, and tore the muscles around my rib case, and so I played six in 100 meters. I didn't win a medal. I was in the hospital for three days uh, at the Air Force Base there in, in, uh, in Japan, and I said, I knew my running days were over. I was 27. Who's going to come back? Who's going to let me come back and run? So I went to OCS. That's what I went to OCS. I went back to Fort Bragg. At the same time, I was still running, breaking all Bob Hayes' indoor records, tying his outdoor records. And then I went to OCS down to Fort Benning, Georgia, became a second lieutenant in, in, um, in um, Fort, Fort Benning. I graduated in 1966. Fort Riders of Kansas, six months, training for jungle warfare in the cornfields and marijuana patches. <laughs> <laughs> then to Vietnam, a Bearcat. First we went into Bearcat, then we went down to the Delta. They pulled me out of Vietnam after five months to train for the 1968 team. I said, what in the world is happening? Because I just knew my days were over in track. That's why I went to OCS, because I, I had to start working on my future. I started going to college at night. So they pulled me out of Vietnam, trained for the 1968 team. During that time, I set a world record in the 60-yard dash at 5.9 seconds, and also in the 70-yard dash at 5.8 seconds. Made the 1968 team at age 31. No one in the history of track and field has ever done that. No one. 
I want to go medal in a four by one relay. Got placed six and a hundred meters. I don't know what happened. I was out 70 meters. I was in front. I don't know. I think a ghost said, you, I don't want you to win this race. But I want to go Mellon, go, want to go Mellon in a four by one. Came back. I was supposed to go to helicopter school, which I had taken all the tests at Fort, Fort MacArthur, California. But they needed captains in Vietnam. They said, you can't go to flight school. So I said, I'm not going. I said, I just got back. I want to go medal. I was, I was rated the best physical specimen in the United States Army at my age, at 31. So they sent me to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and gave me a company, 82nd Airborne Division. Ben Malcolm was my battalion commander. The greatest commander I ever had in my entire military career. Of course, I was good. I'd been there as an enlisted man. And every inspection, we were number one, my company. We jumped on the Han River. My company was the first company out. Flew from, Okina flew from Fort Bragg, Okinawa, and jumped on the Han River. Came back, straight to Vietnam, six months. 82nd Airborne Division, they rotated back, and I worked for Ambassador Kobe, CIA. He became the CIA director. Eight months, pulled me out, pulled me out of Vietnam again. They kept pulling me out. I don't know why in the hell they kept pulling me out. She left me home. So I trained for the 1972 Olympic team. I was stationed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. I mean, I'm sorry, West Point Military Academy. I was the first African-American coach at West Point. While at West Point, I didn't make the 72 Olympic team. I, pulled the, I strained the most of my right hamstring. I would have made that team because I was kicking those butts, the young boys' butts, I'm telling you. I was, still, I was, 31, I was 34 years old. I was still running world record. I set a world record uh, when I turned pro, running on the weekend, set a world record in a six-yard dash at 5.8 seconds. Not bragging, y'all, just damn good. <laughs> <laughs> but life has been, you know, my military career is, is not just sitting down running track. I was an infantry officer. I was a staff sergeant. I love my men. They love me. I knew how to treat my men. They knew if I said jump off this building, I would jump off that building first. It's how you treat people. Growing up in the South, it wasn't easy. Came back from, when I came back from Vietnam, and before they sent me back to Nam after the 68 Olympics, I took my mother to the doctor in Shamley. And she took me in the back door of this doctor's office and had a little table there and two chairs. And I said, why are we back here? She said, this, this is what we said. I said, no, we don't. I said, we're Americans. I mean, racism, we don't have that kind of racism anymore in America. I just got back from Vietnam fighting my country. I'm not sitting in the back of nobody's building, bus, nowhere. So the doctor came out and he threatened me. Now, he didn't know I was a black belt karate. <laughs> but he called me a boy. Nobody calls me boy. I'm a man. I'm an American. I fought for my country and I die for my country today if they sent me over anywhere in this world to fight because I love America. My mother cried, I cried, but she didn't understand that. And I was very curious when I was a kid. I asked the questions like, Mom, in Dalton, the, the troop, troop trains were stopping at, in Dalton on the tracks, and there was the black troops on one end of the train and the whites on the front end of the train. I would go home and ask my mother. Now, Mom worked at $16 a week. She'd come home as a maid, and her feet would hurt so bad, I would get a, a, a bucket and put some vinegar in it. She, my, mo my mother was part Cherokee Indian. My great grandmother was full Cherokee Indian. She had beautiful long hair. My sister would comb my hair and I would scrub her feet. And I asked her these questions. I says, Mom, why are the troops going to fight the same war and they are on different trains? But I know when you cross the American Dixon line, Dixon line, if you're traveling from south to the north in Indiana, you had to get off the train and blacks and whites sit on the same train. That was back in the day. I don't know whether you people old enough to remember that or not. But I never could understand these kind of things when I was a kid because we all Americans. This country is made up of all nationalities. Not one race in this room that you have don't have some other type of blood in you. Scott, Irish, Scott, French, like me, I have Bahamian in me and, and, and Cherokee Indian. And my lovely wife back there, I call her my little preacher wife, she's a minister. She's have Bohemian, French, uh, she has German, and uh, she might have everything. She's got a whole stuff of it. But, but she's a woman. She's a human being like me and like you. And the things that happen as a kid, I could, never could understand it because we are Americans. I remember taking my wagon and, and, and 
and, and, and picking up scrap iron during the Second World War in Dalton when, when they bombed Pearl Harbor, they, was, they needed scrap iron to build weapons. Any people old enough to remember that? You, they, this guy named Shorty would come to my neighborhood and pick up scrap iron, and we would do that so we could make enough money to go to the movies. That's what you call patriotism. That's when people in my little town in Dalton was just like this, no matter what color you were, what race you were. We worked together as one. And there's so many things that happened, to, happened in my life. If you read that book, I'm just telling you half of the stuff that happened. But I persevered and I had God in my life. And the only reason I got out of Vietnam was because of God. He had a mission for me. He had me, he had me come out of Vietnam and run track in Tokyo. He had me come out of Vietnam and run track in Mexico City. And also to train for the 1972 Olympic team. I used to go to church every Sunday. You go to Sunday school, you go to church, you go to Sunday school, you go to BTU, and sometimes you go back at night. There is a God. God has made, made us all the same. There's no different what color you may be, red, black, blue, green, white. It doesn't make any difference. We are one people. Until we in America realize that we all one people, God made us all the same. We always gonna always have problems. You can be the richest person in the world. You can live in the biggest house. You can have the biggest car. You can have the nicest clothes. But God made us the same. I fought in Vietnam. A young man died in my arms. He was white. He wasn't a black kid. He was white. He was an American. I didn't look at him being white. I look at him as an American. He died in my arms. Because he died for everyone that lived in this country. I had a couple of black kids got shot, got wounded. We all bleed red, people. There's only one color that we bleed. And God put us all one people. We still have problems in this country. Why do we still have problems in this country? I can't understand it because God has given so much in this country for Americans. He gave, he's given us so much. You walk outside and look, at the, look up in the sky. Look at the buildings. Look at the, 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 just the scenery that God has given us as Americans. But we still have people in America with crooked minds. Not only black people, but white people, Chinese people. We still discriminate against one another. I was invited to West Point last week to a diversity conference. And I had been there in 41 years. And they still have problems at West Point with women. And when I was at West Point Military Academy, after I retired, I was traveling 60 to 70 miles a day from West Point to Staten Island to Long Island, New York to finish my degree at Adelphi University. I left at 5.30 in the afternoon and I'd be there at 7. I did it twice a week because I'm the only officer at West Point that didn't have a college degree. I graduated with honors. And when I applied for the head coaching job at West Point, the commandant said we weren't ready for a black coach at West Point. How do you think that made me feel? Bronze star. The infantry badge, all types of medals on my chest. I had so many I can't tame them all. Hall of Famer. I'm in 11 Hall of Fames, y'all. 11. Y'all pull the clap. <laughs> now, how many people that you know that's in 11 and about to be inducted into the USA Track and Field Hall of Fame next year and then also into West Point Coaches Hall of Fame? That'd be 13. I gotta get one more because I, like I don't like that number 13. So I gotta find one more. But God has been so good to me. But when I was at West Point, the, you know, that was one of the most devastating things that ever happened to me. The coach died. He was like a father to me, Coach Carlton Crow. He was at 25 years and I had, the years that I stopped running track, I had the best season, the two years I was there as head coach, that ever, they ever had at West Point. It was a big thing up there. But why? Because of the color of my skin. I'm in this room, there's only, what, three black men in this room, one just left. There's a little show, I call him little man. I'm taller than he is. I'm taller than you. 
but it's not about color. It's about people. It's about people. It's about American. It's about us living together as one. Now, you probably didn't think you're going to hear a speech like that today, but I speak from my heart. It's the only way I know how to live. I love people. I'm a giver. I'm not a taker. And every day, my lovely wife and I, we always giving something to somebody. Until we learn how to give and love one another, we always going to have people with crooked minds treating people bad. You find people in this country that have, the, that, that, that have uh, positions and money that they can say and do anything they want to somebody just to hurt them because they can. It's happening right now in our government. I'm not calling no names. But it's happening right now. This is America. And I say, why? I never seen anything like this in my life. I'm going, I'll be 80, I'm 88, in October I'll be 80. But for us to have what's see what's going on now in America and we're pulling people apart. It's pulling, it, racism is, in this country right now, it's gotten really, really bad because of what's happening in, our, in, in Congress right now, in our government. Why? In Vietnam, we had blacks die, we had Chicanos die, we had whites die, we had Indians die. They all died for one country. And they all bled one color that was red. One color. And my wife says, you know, you're too sensitive. Well, I've always been a sensitive person because I love people. I love my wife. My wife is white. I don't look at my wife being a white woman. I look at my wife as looking at being a woman. She's a woman. She's a beautiful woman. She has a heart big as gold. She's a giver. She's a lover. And everybody that meets that young lady sitting back there, of course I robbed the cradle, but they love her. People, we have to learn how to love. We have to learn how to learn about different cultures and life of people. You probably don't know much about me because, because I'm, I'm, I'm African American. But I can tell you one thing about me. I love the red, white, and blue. I love my country and I love you. And we all bleed one color and that's red. Thank you. We got a couple of minutes. Mel said if you anybody has any questions they'd like to ask, you'd be willing to, to take a few. What kind of drugs would you take? <laughs> <laughs> when? <laughs> well, well, no, I, I guess it's God and, and uh, the life that I've lived. Uh, no drugs, no, uh, only drugs I, I was taking was for pain. And I had to go through detox. My wife, it wasn't for that woman back there. I, I wouldn't be here today because I think I would have killed myself. I, I feel sorry for drug addicts and alcoholics. To go through what I went through, to get off all that medic pain medication, is unbelievable. You know, I had seven operations. I had uh, prostate cancer. I'm still suffering with chemo right now. But I look good, don't I? <laughs> yeah. That's all the love for God. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I didn't tell you about my role model. My role model is my grandfather. And also Audie Murphy, he was my role model too. But my, grand, but my grandfather, he was only had a third education. And he said, tell me about his great-grandfather that was a slave. And he'd tell me about the life he had to live and the life he had to live when he was growing up. And he, he, would, he, would, he, he, read, he learned how to read his Bible, learned how to read from his Bible. And he would tell me stories about his life. And he would say, read. He would say, listen. He said, do your arithmetic. And my buddies would be down and sitting on the porch listening to him. Because he'd be trying to give us advice how to, when we grew up, things we had to do to be successful in life. And my buddies would say, your grandfather is crazy. <laughs> but you know that word, listen? 
That word is listen is the reason I am the person you see standing here today. Amen. Because I listen to people. And I listened and I, and I counsel people today. My wife and I counsel kids Sunday. The kids from Africa. His mother, he's 22 years old, and, he's, and, he, and she said, you either go, to an air, go in the military or you get out of my house. So we tried to counsel this kid, and I, that word I, I, I preached to him. You have to listen to people older than you are, because we've been to the mountaintop. We've been through everything you're going to go through. If you, don't, if you listen, you won't have those, those uh, problems with life. But if you listen, I listen. I used, I used my grandfather's advice. I went to college. I got a degree. When I graduated from OCS, my grandmother was down in Fort Benning, Georgia. When I called my name, I walked across the stage. My grandmother said, that's my boy. <laughs> Embarrassed the hell out of me. <laughs> but you know, after a ceremony, the, uh, the general came, had his aide find my grandmother. And he, and he called, found my grandmother and found me, and he was told me how proud he was of me. And she told him how proud I was. I graduated like th uh, at 132 in my class. I think I was 18th in my class. I had leadership. I was a staff sergeant when I went to OCS. But those things that I remember, I remember to the day I die. And I preach that to kids every day. When I'm talking to kids, I preach that to them. Listen. Get an education. And I preach them by going in the military. Because if it wasn't for the military, gentlemen, the ladies, I wouldn't be the man you see standing here. You wouldn't see. You wouldn't, I would probably be in jail or in dead. Or dead. That's right. Because all my buddies are gone that didn't get in that recruiter's car that morning when he came to my house to pick me up and went to my buddy's house to pick him up, they wouldn't come to the door. I'm the only one that got in that car. And look at me now. I'm very successful. You know, I got a great life. And I love people. Thank you. You know, we are so fortunate and so honored to have Mel be one of us. And it's a real joy that he's willing to step into the fray this morning. And thank you so very, very much thank for doing you. that. God bless. And yes, he does.